Ladies and gentlemen, guys and gals, hey, welcome. I don't know where you're at, but today is a gorgeous day here in San Diego. So hopefully you're having the same kind of great day where you are in the world. Now, if you're new to the show, I'm glad you found it. Uh, what we do on this show is soup called Super Agents Live. I talk with top producing real estate agents, coaches, and authors. Now, this show is really a show about entrepreneurship, but through the lens of a real estate agent. So if you're new and you're a plumber, pie maker, or or painter, uh, you can learn from this show. So uh, today's super agent is a guy named Bob Zachmeyer. Now, Bob, he's got a very interesting niche or niche, however you want to say it. Uh, what he does is he fu- he he goes out and he you know this this niche works in slow markets and and hot markets, and basically I don't want to give it all away, but basically what he does is uh, he feels that the problem in real estate today is the ability to get financing. So what he does is he finds somebody who wants to sell their house. Uh, he goes uh, uh, and and they're they're going to sell it at market. Um, he goes and gets an, a bunch of investors to buy or you know one or multiple multiple investors to purchase that house. They own it free and clear. And then he goes and finds somebody who is currently renting or locked out of the uh, home purchasing market and puts them in there with a sort of like a, you know, a lease to own kind of a thing. Now, everybody wins in this. I mean, everybody wins. And he, and Bob, you know, Bob wins. He gets paid three different times on a single transaction. Number one, number two, the person who wants to sell their house gets it sold. The investors uh, get to invest in a very rock solid uh, asset, and then the the person buying the house gets an opportunity to purchase a house which they normally would not be able to. So, very very interesting. He's dominating his market. Nobody else is doing this. Uh, so I had him on the show to explain it to you guys, and hopefully you know you, you know this may not be for everybody, but it's it's certainly an interesting thing to at least have in your back pocket when you come across uh, uh, you know a situation like that now um, if you don't know uh, we do uh, we have a very strong Twitter tribe uh, the hashtag for this show I haven't mentioned it in a while but it's uh, at the, it's unpack that idea now that's a big follow train um, so uh, you know t- go out and tweet and use that hashtag and you'll get followers uh, secondarily, I want to tell you something I'm doing now. All of you obviously know that uh, that I'm putting agents on the radio. So there's uh, there's historically only been one game in town. If you want to do radio advertising, uh, there was this other guy, and now uh, you know I've stepped in doing it. Uh, and I have you know I look across the country, I'm actually starting to put agents on, and and we're starting to see some success. So if you've been thinking about incorporating radio into your marketing platform. Uh, send me an email. Let's let's talk. Let's see if you uh, let's see if you're a good fit. Not everybody is. You have to have a team. Anyhow, okay. <clears throat> but listen, for you podcast lovers, again, I'm glad you found the show. But the name of this show, as I mentioned before, Super Agents Live. Now, if you are on tw- uh, uh, iTunes and you see my show, a lot of people say, "Hey, man, I saw your show, but I had no idea that it, what it was about, and I had no idea be you know was so valuable." And they listen to it and they're like, "Man, I." Just, you know, it's awesome. So I'm actually launching a new show uh, and it's and it's going to be very simple, simply named. It's going to be real estate top producers. Now, for you folks who have been found the show and have been listening to this show, it's the same content. I'm just taking the my old interviews and I'm, I'm republishing them under another feed because I believe there's a lots of people out there that that would love this show and find value in this show. But since the name is pretty generic, just super agents live, they're like, oh, what is this? Uh, I, I, you know, I was I don't know. I don't know. I didn't take that into account when I when I set it up. So um, here's what I would love, man. Uh, we're going to be launching a show um It'll probably go live in a couple of days, maybe maybe over this weekend. Uh, you're listening to this on Friday, so. Uh, but I, here's what I'd love: I'd love for you to help the new show out and go and give it a rating and review. Um, you've probably already heard the interviews, but it would really help that show out. And again, just I wanted to get to into you know new and noteworthy, and I'm going to flood. It's going to be you know because I have all the episodes already. I'm going to do uh, for eight. You're on iTunes. You get into you're able. You're new and new noteworthy, ready and able, for only eight weeks. So what I'm going to do is historically I've launched this show uh, three times a week. Uh, I'm just going to go. I'm going to bang on that one. Uh, uh, seven days a week. So I'm just going to, uh, it's going to be a ton of ton of episodes. So hopefully that'll help it. But okay. Hey, enough about me. Let's get to the show. Let's get to Bob. Welcome to super agents live. 
This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. Yeah. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate yeah. entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Coughs out. <clears throat> hey, Bob, thanks for taking the time out today. Listen, I've, I've given the audience a brief overview of your background, but maybe take a minute. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Okay, sure, Toby. Um, I am a, a real estate broker here in Tucson, Arizona. My wife and I both worked for Raytheon. We had a combined 42 years of, of work in engineering fields. We started our own brokerage in 2004 uh, after retiring from Raytheon, and in the last 10 years, we've closed over 3,000 houses. Unbelievable, man. So you – so. <laughs> I mean, I would want to do that math. So that is basically, so if you started in 2004, it's 2014 as the time of this recording. Uh, quick math, that's 10 years. 3,000 divided by 10, you get 300 houses per year. That's amazing. Like what? Okay. So you're an engineer. You're, you're, you're a numbers guy. You're not necessarily a people person. How does a, how does a numbers guy go from like crunching stuff and the numbers in the back to all of a sudden putting up 300 transactions per year? Well, the biggest thing is, is focusing on problems, and that's what engineering people kind of do is they solve problems. So instead of advertising with a photo of myself, and that was the big baffling thing when I got out of engineering and into um, real estate, why would people put a picture of themselves on a sign? Who, who really cares? And it's more about how can you help these people than look at me. I have a real estate license. This is a photo of what I look like in high school. So, okay. Which, which is a joke, by the way. <laughs> no, no, it's not a joke. It's, I'll tell you what. So we have – you're, you're, you're a little – I'm sure you're an older than me. But so I, you're, I, are you on Twitter or no? I am not on Twitter. Okay, that doesn't matter. The, the point I'm going to make is we have a very, very strong Twitter tribe, and my Twitter handle for everybody in the audience, if you don't know, is just at Super Agents Live. But I see these people, and I see this picture, and a lot of times I will end up communicating with these people, maybe even get on the phone. I'm like, dude, how old are you? And they're like, I'm 45. I'm like, oh, your picture, your Twitter picture. And he's like, hey, I'm in, I'm in a realtor. Like, I never, I never change my picture. So that's not a joke. That's like real. People do that. So, right. so you realized... You, you know, as an engineer, you said, I solve problems. I want to do, obviously, you're doing real estate a little bit different way. What kind of problems did you solve that, that, that you saw in the market that was not being addressed by other agents? Um, well, in slow markets, when houses aren't selling, you come up with a way to sell their homes that, that benefit everyone. And for instance, right now, the, the biggest challenge in the, in the real estate industry is, is the ability of, pe of people to get financing. So banks are turning down. I don't know if you saw this. For the month of June 2014, they turned down almost 50% of all loan applications. So you do your marketing. You go out and find buyers. Now half of all the people you found just got turned down by the bank and they can't buy a house. So for the last couple of years, I've actually been finding retired people who can't live on the 0.2% that the banks are paying them in interest, I'm getting them to finance the houses for the buyers that the banks turn down. So basically I'm the only game in town for them to, to get a loan. And you know, I, they drive, they drop everything to come meet with me. Um, the people that are slightly upside down in their home still because the market is coming back, but it's not all the way recovered here yet. So there are several people that are still upside down, roughly one-third of all people with mortgages. So if they're getting close, do you think a, a buyer with credit challenges would gladly pay a, a premium on a house, uh, you know, the high end of the range, um, to be able to get into it with, the, with the financing? So when I offer financing, I get the retiree more money, 35 times more than the banks are paying them. I get the seller a higher price for their home, which enables them to sell. When, when otherwise they couldn't, and I get the buyer a home that nobody else would let them have. And the good news is I get paid every step of the way for doing it, doing what I love to do and, and you know, helping everybody else in the equation. 
Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, that for, for the people who have cash out there, you're older and, you know, you get 35x, right? 35 times. You know, I'll tell you. So here I, I am. I'm holding I'm, I'm a bit of an investor. I'm holding one house today. Let me tell you how I did it. And I did. I did seller financing. So I, I bought the house. It's, I own it free and clear. I bought it in 09. I got a great deal on it. So um, <clears throat> so I put it up for sale. And this is three years ago I did this. This note is coming due. So I want to know how you structure yours and, and how people can, in other markets, kind of model what you've done. So here's what I did, Bob. Um, put it up for sale, found a bunch of people, and they, and they couldn't, you know, a bunch of people could not qualify, right? The people who could qualify, they didn't want to pay me what, what I was asking for it and what it was worth. It's a, it happens to be a five-acre ranch here in, in San Diego. So pretty rare that you get that kind of land. Um, so... A few people said, okay, yeah, I'll pay you your asking price, but I, I have a very small down payment and I can't get financing. I, I filed for bankruptcy like three years ago. Now, I did my due diligence. I looked at them. This particular p- per people, the, the uh, couple that I, that I did the deal with, they had a, a successful business. So I knew their business was there. I knew they had revenue. So what I did, I said, listen, if I'm going to take the risk, I'm going to give you – um, you know, we're, we're going to take what the standard rates or what people are saying that you can get from a bank, and I'm going to add two points to it. So, so at the time, uh, it was 4.5 that you, like people are kind of the teaser rate you'd hear on commercials. So I said, Hey, I'll finance it at 6.5%. And then what I did right to, to, because I was very, very scared of writing a mortgage on a property and then they, they don't pay. And then like the whole eviction process is very difficult. So I wrote them a land contract or basically sort of a, a fancy lease to own, but that allowed me to keep my name on the property. I made them pay for the, the property tax again, but the house was in my name. So I got – they paid for the property tax, but I got the write-off because that's – it's in my name. Um, and that was part of the deal. So uh, – and now they're sure. – now their note's coming due and I and, – and overall – Overall, I sold the house for like three ninety, and I've made in that three years I made uh, seventy about seventy five grand purely in interest. So so I'm in a, so for me like the sales price right instead of three ninety was at the top of the market I fundamentally got right uh, four sixty for it. Sure. So how how do you and, sp- and what would you have done with the money? I mean, if you didn't have it earning you you know six and a half percent, what what would you have done with the money that would have I've earned that much. Well, you know what I would have done? You're, you're saying if, if somebody would have been able to finance it and me just sell it outright? Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah, so I would have. I was flipping houses at the time, and there's lots of other deals. So I would have taken that cash and bought another place. And, and uh, yeah, I would have. Th- th- that money would have made me at least that 75K, probably more. But, I, but, but th- again, that's assuming I can find another deal and all that stuff. Sure, but uh, but again, and not, also there's no sweat equity in, in mailbox money. You there just you go. Go to the mailbox, get your check, and put it in the bank. Yeah. Well, so okay, so that's that's certainly interesting. So tell me how you structured that, and and because um, you you get paid, uh, you know, so you get paid three times, right? So you get paid from uh, helping the the buyer or the seller sell, right? So that's your three percent there. You, you so you, you're double ending the deals. Number one. Uh, it sounds like, and then, right. and then, and, and just so you know, if I, without uh, price fixing and quoting a commission, if I s- sell and bring financing to the table, I do get a higher uh, commission than what might be standard for your area. Oh, um, and and on all these these sales, I mean, basically, I have the buyer and I have the seller, so it's pretty much a double sided sale on on every one. That's amazing, dude. So why is nobody competing with you? And what market are you in real quick, Bob? Tell everybody. Tucson, Arizona. Tucson. Um, so you've been doing this for a while. How come nobody has said, hey, geez, Zach Meyer's putting up 300 transactions every month. Uh, let me, uh, you know, let me try to. Not every month. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. Every year. I'm, I apologize. I was every year. Um, you know, why is it that nobody has stepped up and modeled what you're doing? Uh, most people can't figure out what I'm doing, and yeah. and there's two different programs I have. One is is bringing in the retirees, and and basically just for nice even math, let's just say that you have a property at a hundred thousand dollar. That would be the FHA appraised value of the property. So then I sell it to someone for one fifteen, and the buyer, let's just say they have fifteen thousand cash down, and then I will structure the loan in two notes a first and a second Mm. because these retirees, I take this very seriously. These retired people don't have the ability to work anymore and earn more money. This is their last hurrah. And I, you know, I don't want to have their money at at, at risk. 
So, well, I mean, anything is a risk, obviously, but I don't want to risk very much. So what I would have them do is give a, like a 70 to 75% loan to value of the $100,000 conservative market value. So in this case, that would be, say, 75000 So now the seller of that home got the $15,000 down from the buyer plus $75,000 from somebody like my mother, who's 80 years old, and now she's getting a 7% first mortgage payment instead of 02 at the bank. Right. So, you know, when she goes to the grocery store, instead of getting one bag of groceries, she's getting 35 for the same <laughs> amount right. of money, basically, yeah. because I just got her 35 times more income. Yep. So now the seller of that home got $90,000, 15 in down payment and 75 in first mortgage funded by someone else. So that means that they only left $10,000 of equity of their own equity in that sale, but the sale price was 115, they only got 90. That means that there's $25,000 left on a second mortgage. And then so you So that second mortgage would would pay on the face value of 25,000 it pays 8%. So just simple interest is is $2,000 a year on a on a $10,000 investment that's 20% return. It's amazing, man. So and then so you go out and find somebody else to put them in so you put the old people in the comfortable first position and then and then you put the the, the second is a little bit more high risk so you, who do you put in the second position well if the seller doesn't want to carry the second i have a line of investors mm. who typically buy that second loan between 50 and 60 cents on the dollar Got so it. in this case let's just say you had a seller that didn't want to carry the twenty five thousand dollar note and i found somebody to step in and take it for half price they're paying twelve five the seller already got 90. Now they're getting 100, 102.5, which is $2,500 more than market value. And they didn't have to carry anything. The, the second mortgage investor is happier in the clam because now they have a, a loan that they paid 12 and a half for that's got an 8% uh, interest rate. They're making 16% on their money. And plus at some point when that loan pays off, let's just say it's five years when the people either refi or sell, now the investor is going to be paid back twenty five thousand instead of the twelve five that they paid, so they get another twelve thousand five hundred dollar profit. What? Which, when divided over a five year period, is another twenty five hundred dollars a year in in, in uh, profit. Wait, run that run that last piece by me again. I I I, I maybe zoned out. I was okay. writing some stuff down. Okay, so the the, the face value of the loan is twenty five thousand dollars. Yep. And it's it's the, the interest rate on that loan is eight percent. Yep. So the investor bought the loan at half price. Oh, that's so right. So basically for their money, they're, they're, they're really getting 16%, even though the buyer is only paying eight. Uh, it's because they, they bought the loan for half price. That's right. They buy now 50, that, 60 cents on the dollar. Right. And so far we're just talking 16% interest. We haven't talked about the other half of the price that has been – has, has been, uh, you know, you have a loan worth 25000 and some day when, when they refire or sell, it's going to be paid off. Yep. And that extra 12500 is going to come into play. Yep. So, you know, if, if the investor invested twelve five, and the, the you know, the, the person pays the loan off and they made an extra twelve five, that's a 100% return on the money plus the 16% you've been getting every year. Wow. It's a smoking good investment. <laughs> that is amazing, man. Um, by, by the way, we should talk after offline, man. I would, I would, uh, I would love to be uh, take part in, in in purchasing some of that some of that second. Um, so, you know what would be really cool? Like just thinking about your business, Bob is right. So. Um, we, you know, you're double ending the deal for the most part, and you know, I don't know what other all the other moving parts where you make money because you, again, you make money all through it. I, I, I don't know where, but it would be really cool for you, right, to to just reinvent because you don't you retired from Raytheon, you don't need the money, but it would be really cool for you to take your or somebody out there who wants to model you, take your commission, apply it towards that that second position that you're going to buy for fifty cents on the dollar. You know, right? And whatever that is, I don't know if at, if at some point your commission would equal that that uh, that twelve grand, for example. Uh, would would it be sure. would it be the, about that amount? Well, if on in this particular deal, let's just say that I made a on this hundred fifteen thousand dollars sale. Okay. If I made a say a seven percent commission, that would be like eight thousand bucks. Um, 
if it was higher than that or low, you know, it, it wouldn't quite come out to the whole thing, but basically if you bought the second yourself, um, you would be within, you know, you basically buy something that pays, uh, well, you'd get it for about $4,000 yep. a note that, that has a face value at 25, plus right. a little bit of sweat, sweat equity of your commission. But honestly, I've never purchased one of those from my client because my fiduciary duty is to do what's best for them, not what's best for me. So I fund it with outside money. I would love to participate in some of these. Yeah. And so what I'm actually doing is I'm training agents in other states and other areas to do this as well. And then I can participate in their sales, but I, I just kind of take the high road as far as participating in my own. Got it. Yeah. You don't need the money. I'm just saying like, you know, for somebody out there, I mean, it would, if I was in your shoes for me personally, I wouldn't see, you know, as long as I did the numbers correctly and I, you know, I, I think I would cover my fiduciary duty and, but that would be amazing, right? You pay 4,000. I, I fund it. $4,000 out of my pocket, and I've done a little work putting everybody together, but now I have this thing that's going to pay me 16%, and, it, and it's got a $25,000 face value. So, And here's the other win. Here's the other win, it seems like, and I don't know how often this happens, but let's say the person that you put in there defaulted, right? So this, the grandma put... put um, uh, she put seventy five grand of her money in there on a deal that that is worth a one fifteen right let 's say that somebody paid for right. three years the house appreciates and uh, and then somebody defaults right they whatever happens they get you know death divorce disease and uh, and then all of a sudden you have to redo this process with someone else but now the house is worth one fifty you know amazing that 's uh, you know speaking of you know uh, um, so Gary Keller, right, leads listing leverage. This is true leverage. I love this, man. I've never had somebody come on the show and talk about this sort of thing. Well, awesome. And, and the thing about the uh, the retired person that now, in your example, if the home is, is now worth 150 then that loan is at 75 but it's been paid down slightly just from the, the regular uh, mortgage payment. So – that because the second behind it is is large you know enough the the second is going to do the foreclosing if it needs to happen and they will make the payments to that first in order to to take control of the foreclosure sale so the first is in a very secure position and worst case scenario it costs roughly twenty five hundred dollars to foreclose but just the reason i want to see significant skin in the game uh, from the buyer is you know they're basically put down a whole bunch of money that, um, that they don't want to lose. And, and now, you know, we, we send every one of these to a lender, a licensed loan originator that checks their credit, does a Dodd-Frank compliance form to make sure that they have the ability to pay. So, I mean, it's all, you know, on the up and up that we're not putting people in that have a, a tendency to fail. And honestly, the people we're finding aren't deadbeats that are laid on their cable bill. A lot of them are self-employed business owners who can't get a loan right now. Right. It's people who have just recently changed jobs and they haven't been on their job for two years. It's people that had a foreclosure or short sale. And now as of August uh, 16th, it takes seven years to get rid of a short sale if you're putting down less than 10% and four years if you're putting down more than 10%. Um, those rules were, were just, you know, on the 15th of August, it was two years that you could get a, a, a loan after a short sale, and now the minimum is four. So you got all these people that have been like tapping their foot, waiting, and and the the bar just got pushed two years down the line from them. So this is a huge, huge opportunity for people to market to all the challenged buyers. And I have a team of five real estate agents on my in my company. Uh, my wife and I own it, and my brother works with us. So I have two other agents besides my brother and my wife. And we've gotten over 3,000 buyer calls on seller financed advertising in the last 12 months. Wow. Wow. So, so, um, uh, by the way, I, 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 this interview and what the content that you're, you're, you're giving us, Bob was, is very unexpected to me. And I'm, I'm very, very excited to dig into it, but, um, and I want to talk about some of the market. Do you know who Steve Harney is, by the way, Steve Harney is a very, very I, big name. I don't, I don't believe so. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. He's, uh, uh, very very smart guy. I've had him on the show, and uh, um, you remind me of him. So I want to I want to get into some of the same stuff that I covered with him. But so so let's talk about the market in general. Uh, well, no, b before we get there. So let's say somebody I'm in San Diego. So let's say I reach out to you and I say, Hey Bob, you know what? Show me you know show me what how to do what you do. Or somebody is I, you're in you're in uh, Tucson. You know somebody in upstate New York or somebody in Northern Cal or whatever. I, I, is there certain markets? where this 
will work and others where it won't work. I'm, and, and again, I, I'm in San Diego. The market's really a hot, hot here. Is it, uh, it, would it not work in, in an environment like this? It, it will work. I mean, it's, it's the challenge in San Diego is the house prices are so high. Mm. Finding someone to finance a loan at 75% on a $600,000, you know, dollars home, that's, that's pretty, uh, you know, to find somebody that's got four hundred grand laying around to put in a first mortgage is a, is a pretty good challenge. Yeah, but couldn't um, you – sorry, not, not to cut you off, but couldn't you just, you know, form a pool, right? So create an LLC. An LLC can have, I think, 35 members and then, you know, and just – and spread that seven hundred grand around 10 people or 15 people or whatever. And, and then whatever you put in, right, is you get proportionally back. Right, and you would want to make your LLC in a state like Arizona – where there's a one-time filing fee of $35 and you're done, not a place like California where it's $2,000 to open an LLC and then 800 a year to keep it open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that, man. I but, but definitely you could, you could do that. That's definitely a, a, a very good way to do it, to uh, minimize the risk. But the, um, you know, now you're starting to get into securities and exchange uh, rules where you have to have you know, certified investors and, and they have to have a proper disclosure about the, the chance of losing and, um, you know, there, there's definitely some, some laws that I don't want to go into, but let me just kind of tell you a, a different version of the plan that would work extremely well and is working extremely well in California right now. Okay. Um, how many people do you think, Toby, went out and, and refinanced their house when the rates dropped? A ton. Everybody, well, if you everybody could. Everybody that could. Yeah. Right. So now the life-changing... I'm getting married, I'm getting divorced, I had another baby, somebody died. I mean, those are the the job changed, I got relocated, I, I got laid off. Those are the reasons why people sell. They're all still happening at the same rate. But why would you want to go pay off a loan that you can't even get anymore? If you've got a 3.5% mortgage or a 3.25% mortgage, why would you go pay that off? What if you let someone else use that loan for the next couple of years while they're fixing their credit? And so what I've been doing is just writing up real estate contracts that have a closing date two to five years out. Okay. And I'll just give you a quick example. I had a a very close friend here that got transferred out of state. They had a $430,000 home that they were about $40,000 upside down on. Um, I sold the home to an insurance salesman. He makes six figures a year but he couldn't get a loan on his own because he had just recently changed companies. So that loan, he's, th- these people had a 3.5% mortgage. We wrote up the uh, payment as if it was a 5.5% on, on today's market value. And so he's paying them basically 2% a year on the bank's money. So the, his loan is 430. 2% a year means they're making $8,600 a year on the bank's money. And, and we wrote it up for a two-year close. So that's 17200 that will be paid off just in premium charged on the bank's interest. And then the principal on that loan is $930 a month being paid off. When you multiply that times 24 months, it's another $23,000 that got paid off just from making the payment each month. So when you add the 23000 that got paid off in principal, to the 17 that they made on premium, they just offset the $40,000 deficit, and we just fixed a short sale for $40,000 just by waiting to close. Oh, um, hold on, man. I'm I, I you lost me there, and I'm I'm actually okay with okay. math. So you have hold. Let me let's just let me just because I have my audience out there, and they're driving in cars or they're walking their dog. So sure, you have a property that's that's. Uh, four hundred thirty thousand dollars. The the yep. it's upside down forty grand. So the the real market value is three ninety. Um, they had a right. loan. The, the the original people had a loan for three point five, and now enters this insurance guy. So he's making a bunch of money, and so tell me tell me like just to make it easy, who like, did the insurance guy move into the house? I, I'm not. I don't know how this. Yeah. How, Okay. He moved in early. We do an occupy before close a, okay. a addendum to the contract, just like if someone's wire didn't make it on time and you let them move in a few days early. Um, he moved in early, and and basically is paying a occupancy fee by the day to live in that house. 
and that occupancy fee equals their their payment, right? Well, let's say it's a thousand dollars. Their their payment on the four thirty at three and a half is a thousand bucks. Let's just say, and he's paying uh, twelve hundred fifty bucks. He's he's paying a two point premium. And he's paying a premium over and above what their payment is. Yes, and then the taxes are a pass through. The uh, if there's a homeowners association insurance, all that stuff is a pass through. Whatever it is, if it goes up, the buyer assumes the higher amount. So in, in California, you have to do it in two contracts. We're, we do it with one here, but you would do a lease contract for two years and a purchase contract that, that doesn't close you know, until two years. But that's how a real estate agent can be paid now is for putting someone in the lease, and then they can be paid again for, for having the sale go through. Interesting. So, so, so the the original people that own the house that were $40,000 upside down, they win – in two ways, they win because they're making the two percent premium, and they win by because the, uh, somebody else is it will is going going to cover the forty grand that they were upside down on. Correct. And then, how does the the the, the insurance guy? How do, uh, why is he? How does he win in this this scenario? He, he locked in his price. He, he saved his place in line. That house can't go up in value. I mean, it, it's appreciating. It, it's definitely appreciated. I did this last August, so we're already a year into it, and and it, it, the the house has gone up in value. He locked in his price last year, so he saved his place in line basically, and he's getting to live in the house of his dreams now rather than waiting until his his uh, credit will allow him to get a loan, and you know he he's getting the the same price. We sold it to him for the market value yeah. without any markup. So, so these these people had a thirty uh, a thirty year fixed at three point five. Now he's going to have to at some point refinance it anyway, right? I mean, uh, um, or or sure. no? Okay, yeah. So in uh, well, well then the, the whole idea is is we again send the people to a lender, find out when they would be able to qualify. The down payment and closing costs that they're going to need on that loan is escrowed every single month. So if we have twenty four months. We take the down payment money plus the amount of that they're going to need total, and we divide it by 24, and they're putting that much a month into escrow. So at the end of the contract, it's not being held by the seller. It's being held by the title company as their down payment. Mm. There's a paper trail that it came from them. And so there's no, oh, gee, I forgot to save at the end of the transaction. It's just, hey, come on in and sign some papers. Let's put the house in your name now. Interesting, man. Um, wow. You just got to be creative to sell homes in this environment. Yeah, so uh, it's funny because um, so so when did you because you started in '04, right? You came from Raytheon. I, I became an agent in 2000. I, um, we, my wife retired in '04, and we started our brokerage right, right after she quit. Okay, and '04 was a great year. '05 was a great year. '06 was a great year. '07 started to get sketchy. '08, the world melts. How did you transition? From you know, from from go 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 times oh four oh five oh six to to what we saw in oh seven and then what we for sure felt in oh eight. Um, well, when I track the market. That's the engineering background that I have. I watch numbers like crazy. I, a market is a component of supply and demand. So I, I track the available supply every month. I track the demand. I track the number of price reductions. I track the days on market. And you can see when you track numbers, you get trends. You get seasonal trends. You get cycle trends. But you can see things happening far below before anybody else realizes that those things are even going on. So one day in 2007, actually late 06, it's all the houses stopped selling. And you started to see price reductions. And the big aha for me came when I actually called one of my clients who had a, a property listed and said, hey, the house down the street just had a price reduction $20,000 less than you're asking. And it's the same exact floor plan on the same street. And that's where the, you know, we got a problem coming because the seller said I would have to bring money to closing in order to sell at that point. So that's where I said, you know, Mm. the only people who are going to be able to sell in this market are the banks that are foreclosing on these people. So I started doing research on how to, you know, get in with foreclosure banks. I mean, who, who knew and I found applications online. I'd go fill them out, and of course, that never went anywhere. So I just the five star conference was coming up in Dallas, Texas, and I bought a plane ticket and and paid to go to the conference. I jumped on the plane, and I came back with Freddie Mac, 
And um, the, the next conference I heard about, I went to and came back with another one. And I, I basically had a track record for over three years of going to a conference and coming back with a new bank each time. And I was hitting 20, 25 conferences a year. And uh, I mean, I was a road junkie. I was spending 40 grand a year on hotel rooms and conference fees. But um, we actually, in the, the worst you know, year, in, in uh, 2011, we, we ended up selling 641 houses. Oh, my word. That is crazy, man. So, I mean, look, there's so much to dig in here, Bob. I had no idea. I had no idea when I first met you that you were going to be like this kind of wealth of knowledge. So let, let's talk about the market real quick. So historically, you know, uh, the, you do a short sale and two years later you could buy a house. Now, what you just told me earlier, you said that they've moved the bar from two to four. Now, and, and I want to say something else. I know I'm talking a lot here, but so so. Uh, the the Credit Forgiveness Act, right? So if, if, if you do a short sale, if you, um, uh, you know, you will get a 1099C from the bank. So, and whatever the deficiency that the bank wrote off, all of a sudden they say, hey, you owe taxes on it. Now, there's been the, this credit for, uh, or de- I'm sorry, Debt Forgiveness Act that has been extended, extended so far in 2014. That has not been extended. What is going to happen, you know, with the moving of the bar from two to four years on short sales, coupled with, uh, if this debt forgiveness act does not get uh, renewed, um, I don't believe it will be renewed. And and I think as people get closer, there's two things that are happening. The market is improving; prices are going back up. So that's in in a way fixing the people that are still paying. And the majority of people who are upside down are are still current on their mortgage. There's you know not that less than 3% of of the loans in this country are are late. Um, So, you know, I think that over time, if it gets close, when you see, when we were in this death spiral and prices were falling and falling and falling every, I mean, day, it was, it was actually quite common that you could come home from work and and your house lost more money than you made. Well, now it's turned around where, you know, prices are improving again. And now people, when they, when hope is back, they can wait it out. But, the other thing is, is when you offer them, hey, if you're upside down, how would you like to get out of your home without destroying your credit? That's the, uh, you know, a, a selling proposition that I offer to buyers in my radio commercials and signs. And, and uh, so I get a lot of my leads that way. And I actually can, with my programs, fix short sales. Yeah, with your right. So it's with, a huge opportunity. So, so, um, so a minute ago, and again, you were talking about this debt forgiveness act. So, you know, it is a way that, you know, for people to, you know, if you're underwater, it's kind of a get out of jail free card a little bit because you, you can get out and not owe taxes. Um, you, do you believe that, that that shouldn't have existed? Is that what you're saying to me? No, I, I, the, it, especially for the people who refinance, treated their house like a piggy bank. If they took money out against the equity of that home, that was not a taxable event because the home didn't sell. So if you took money out and, and now you're selling it short, I totally believe you should pay taxes on that because you took the money. I mean, now, if you bought a home as your primary residence, didn't, didn't piggy bank it and, and take out a loan against it, and then you've lost your home, um, that I think should be looked at in a different light. But I'm you know, mm. the, the day I start making my business depend on government decisions is the day I go out of business. Right, <laughs> right, right, for sure. But, and I, I just, you know, I just like to look at, you know, forecasts. But again, you know, in 2013, the, that, that law sunsetted in 2012. And then Q4, I believe, in 2013, they... They, uh, they renewed it and renewed made it retroactive it. back. So, so we'll, yeah, well, they're re- right, retroactive. And we'll see if that happens again in 2014. Um, um yeah, that's interesting. So, so, uh, so, what again? Going back to the short sale, moving the bar from two years to four years. I mean, isn't that right? Everything is, you mentioned earlier. Everything's about supply and demand. Now, if you move the bar, right? If you did a short sale, and and before you could buy a house in two, and now it, now it's going to be four. Um, aren't you messing with the demand side of the equation a little bit? Well, the demand is people. The, the demand for a home, again, is job-related, relationship-related, or family-size-related. So either you have more or less in your family, a, a, a job change or a promotion, demotion, or a, a marriage or a divorce where you're merging families or breaking them apart. But, you know, those things are still happening. So the, the people have not been able to act because of how much they owed in the past. 
So you have some markets like your market that's basically recovered all of the all of the equity lost, and now you've freed all the people who couldn't sell for the last four years. You freed them all at the same time. So basically now I think you're going to see a surge, and you're already seeing it in inventory coming up because all of a sudden everybody can sell. So we have the government stepping in and artificially retarding the recovery of the – and this is just one thing. I mean, this was August 16th when in one day they took a person from two years to four years um, on a short sale. What about the um, change in the ability to repay where they said that a qualified mortgage now is 45 – it went from 45% debt-to-income ratio to 43 that 2%, I've seen different numbers, between 5 and 15% of the buyers that that took out of the market just by changing that by 2%. But the biggest, scariest thing that we have in this real estate market right now is, is college uh, kids graduating with student loan debt. Their student loan debt is actually pushing them into a place where they can't get a house. And the National Association of Realtors said that a normal real estate market has 40% first-time home buyers. Thus far in 2014, we have averaged 29% first-time home buyers. So keep, you know, that, that's a 27.5% drop in first-time home buyers. And that, that's what starts the food chain. I mean, if somebody doesn't buy the lowest end house, that person can't move to the next one and the next one and the next one. So you, you talk about a threat to the real estate market. If you don't do something to, to alleviate this college debt, I mean, the, the wages that kids, and it's all job related, the, um, the wages that kids out of college are getting is 10% lower than it was 15 years ago. But college tuition on the last 15 years has increased 6% a year. So when you look at the chart and you actually see it on a chart, it looks like the, the jaws of a shark. I mean, one's going straight up and the other one's going straight down. And, and, and the spread just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And, and first-time homebuyers, I think that's the biggest challenge uh, for this market. And then the Dodd-Frank legislation came in and took out, you know, a whole bunch of investors who would do private lending and put five-year balloons on. And, and now you can't do that anymore unless it's a one-time thing to get out of the house you have. I mean, there's every time the government, you know, Ronald Reagan said it best, the nine most feared words in the world are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Right, right. So, so but again, let, 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 I want to go back because I, I, I really am curious about this. So I want to couple this 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 short sale bar. And there's lots of stuff that you mentioned that I want to talk about. But but okay, so two percent um when you uh oh geez. I, I you said so much, man. So um when you mentioned two percent and that affected five, the, a pool of five percent of buyers. When I was saying demand, right? So when you take when you take when you can re- buy a house at two years after short sale, then you say, okay, no no no, it's four years how what you know what kind of percent of buyers out there is that taking out of the market right and then and then what is that going to do to the 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 prices or you know um uh you know the the number of sales am i asking that question wrong bob no no i get what you're saying and it it honestly it depends by year because and you have to go back and look at the data from core logic of how many short sales there were in the country and how many foreclosures there were in the country and then you can see when the people got foreclosed on or had a short sale when they would be eligible and now that when they're when they're pushing back i yeah. mean short sales have been on the decline here in uh in in um, september of 2011 was when our mark market here in tucson arizona bottomed and at that point in time only 40 percent of our sales were traditional real estate sales without a foreclosure or a short sale we are now at almost 85 percent traditional sales yeah so there's very few short sales left i mean the, Short sales are, are like a root canal. I mean, by the time the bank gives you an approval, you probably have equity in the property anyway. Got it. Okay. All right. So, so let's talk about this, right? So you said you, earlier when you were talking about demand, you said, well, that you know, demand comes from uh, you know, uh, people getting married, having new kids, and jobs. Now, I want to get your take on this. So if you go back to 2012, um, everybody said, hey, listen, the housing market is not going to come back until unemployment bounces back. Now, we can look at the numbers from the current administration, and you know, it, it appears numbers-wise that jobs are getting better. Uh, although, although m- those numbers, the increased numbers that we're seeing and the reduction in the unemployment rate is really being caused by, by more b- service-oriented jobs, right? Blue-collar, not even, not even, correct. you know, so how in unemployment, 
or employment has not come back. How are we seeing this, this housing market and, and unemployment being disjointed, right? You still don't have strong employment, but housing prices are, are normalizing. Well, the reason for that is, is the interest rates. If, if you put the interest rates back at, at 2007 levels, you'd be paying seven and a quarter for a, for a uh, and that's with an 800 credit score to, to get a, a mortgage. Well, we're still in the low fours. We're three points cheaper than that. So, you know, in a, in a market like yours where, you know, a home is, say, $600,000, um, 3% of that is what eighteen thousand dollars a year? That's fifteen hundred dollars less a month in payment than it would have been for the same exact house back in '07. So uh, officially, I mean, jobs don't have to pay as much in order to keep the houses the same or the market back to the the post recession or pre recession levels as long as interest rates stay low. But when the rates start to to rise and everybody speculates they will, um, that's where you're going to find the problem because you're absolutely right about jobs. You know, we're seeing all these, oh, look, we're back to, you know, pre-recession employment levels. Well, great, but what's the pay that those jobs are, are, right. are providing? And yep. it's nowhere near the same level. As I said, I just found a statistic yesterday online about the uh, college kids and, and that since the year 2000, the, the starting pay for a college uh, graduate is, is down by 10%. And, and over the last 15 years, look at what expenses have done. Right. Yeah. I mean, look at gas, for example. So I want to talk about first time homebuyers in a second. I, I want to get your take on my situation. So my situation is um, I, I, I own five houses. I own three of them free and clear okay. um, and two of them I had mortgages on. Now, the one I kept the first house I bought, I kept that that is at a five and a half, 30 year fixed. Um, my my where I live, I, I paid a million bucks for this in oh four. Um, and look, I want, before we get to, oh man, there's so many things that are tied to this. Okay. So you go out and buy a house. When you buy a house, you get a mortgage on it and that is a non-recourse loan. And I think a lot of people don't understand this. Th- that is a non-recourse loan. Now what will happen to most people and what did happen to me, I bought the house and it was at like whatever mortgage, I forget what rate I had. Uh, but literally a month or so after I bought the house, my, my guy came back to me and said, hey, Toby, hey, hey, let's refi. It's not going to cost you anything, and I, I can save you X amount per month. And I said, okay, well, why not, right? But what happens when you refinance a house, that a n- loan goes from a non-recourse loan to fully recourse. Okay, so that means that if okay. the, right, the banks wanted to, they can come after you. Now, so I tell, you know, I tell people, right, if you don't have to refi, you pro- you're unclear about your future, don't refi because, you know, right, it, it, without refinancing, it's a non-recourse loan. And at least I know this is in California. I don't know if it's across the nation. Now, so I – so the, when the guy refied me – and I want to get – I don't know if you have any thoughts on recourse, non-recourse. Um, when the guy refied me, he put me into a 10-year fixed at 5.25. Now, and he said – and I said, well, I want a 30-year fixed. I'm sorry, a 10-year arm. I, I said that wrong. Um, and he said, okay. well, he said, well, you know what? Hey, everybody, nobody stays in their house for 10 years. So that's fine. Let's do the 10 year arm and we'll refi you later. Now, unfortunately, again, I have cash. I can pay my house off. It's not smart to, um, but I'm now in this arm. It's going to adjust like literally like next month. And I don't know, like I can't refinance cause I don't have, I'm not a W2 employee. What is going to happen to me and, and what should I do uh, in the, in the near future or long-term future? Well, depending upon what the the rate that they're tied to, if it's to a LIBOR, I mean, there's a chance your loan could actually go down in interest rate. Um, I took a gamble on my personal home back in 2003, and, and I got an arm for five years, and I was guaranteed to save 500 a month for five years, which is, you know, 60 months. <laughs> so for the 30 grand guarantee, I thought, I'm going to get an arm. Well, my arm over the last... 11 years has been cheaper than it was when I originated the loan because it keeps adjusting lower. Mm. So I think, I honestly don't believe that interest rates are going to change very much. They can't. It would, it would absolutely just kill the housing market. Um, at, at a, it's very, very fragile. And with just all of the legislation and everything that it just seems every time you turn around, they're doing something different to protect, you know, the, the home uh, buyer and the homeowner 
the, the appraisal management companies. I mean, all these things. So I, I really don't think the rate's going to get you. I, okay. I, I, I'd be shocked. I, I, I would almost bet that it goes down. Got it. Okay, cool. I mean, look, that makes me feel better. Okay, so so let's talk about this first-time home buyers. You're saying that because there's a lack of first-time home buyers, typically it should be 40% entering the market. Today it's at 23%, and you attribute that to 20, the, 29%. 29%, today. I'm sorry. 29%. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, you know, these are these millennials. Um, now, I just NAR just came out with some stats, and uh, they broke out the millennials, uh, the Gen Xers, which is me, and then the Boomers. And it was amazing that the millennials, even though everybody thought they're not buying houses, they 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 were thirty one percent of the sales, uh, and it just said sales, not first time. But and then Gen X, I was you know Gen Xers were thirty, and then Boomers were the other thirty. So very even across the board. Um, what right. happens? What happens, Bob? If if we don't normalize these first time home buyers, right? If it stays at twenty nine or potentially goes under, what 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 happens to to the world? What happens to real estate? Well, the the people in the in the move up buyers or the end of the line retirees who are downsizing, they're going to go put their homes on the market for sale, and there won't be the buyers to to purchase them. That's going to have a oversupply of, of homes and an undersupply of buyers, which is going to face, uh, force downward pressure on, on the market, and, and prices are going to fall. The only thing that's kept prices where they are right now is is the interest rates. So, because I mean, you're not a magician. If you don't make enough on your job to afford a home, you can't buy one. <laughs> Okay, so so if if I'm a real estate agent out there, and I and I'm you know, dude, Bob, you are a guy. I mean, you, the I had again, I had no, I, you're a super smart guy. I had no idea that that I I was going to have this kind of brain, you know, on the other end of the mic today. I would have prepared a little bit more. I didn't prepare anything. I just showed up. So, um, but if I'm an agent out there and I hear all the stuff you are saying, and I go, man, Bob's a smart guy. I'm going to try to. I, I I'm going to build my business. Maybe I shouldn't focus on for the first time home buyer kind of market, right? And I'm not saying going after buyers, but that there's a dim, whatever you live, there is a first time, the entry price for first time home buyers are kind of clustered, right? In, in, in here, right. You know, that might be 350 to 450, right? And in, in your market, it might be, a, I don't know what it is. So, so how, how should people build their business? Should they steer away from that price point and go, hey, you know what? I'm going to focus on, um, these where these boomers are downsizing, right? If they're going from a, a four thousand square foot house, they're going to a twelve hundred square foot house, but sort of in an upscale area. I mean, is that what can pe- how can people use this data to, to to help build their business? Okay, well, first of all, I mean, you're paid as a percentage of sales price typically on your commission. So you know, the higher the sale price, the more money you make for the same amount of work on on a sale. But the the key is to find the sweet spot where it's the highest price possible before you start having significant drop-offs. And, and in this downturn in the economy for four years, people were afraid of the economy. They couldn't get loans. So when they sold, they actually downsized rather than upsized. That created a big void in the middle and especially at the high end. Uh, you're you're going to laugh at this, but we have currently in Tucson, Arizona, 125 homes listed for sale that are less than $100,000. And they are not getting offers. They're they're not selling. We have 208 that are less than one and a quarter. But the big number is we have almost uh, what's 161 this month homes listed over a million dollars. Last month we sold five out of 161. Total, so not we, you. We're the, talking the market. No, moved no. This five. is the total. The MLS. There's Got 6, thousand real estate agents here. And, and there were a total of five homes sold over a million dollars. Wow. Which is a high number. I mean, the last couple of years, it's been one or two a month. But we're running, you know, like a 2% absorption rate on those houses. 2% sell, 98% don't sell. When you get into the $800,000 homes, we're looking at an 8% absorption. When you get into half million, we're right around 12%. So only 12% are selling. 88% of the houses aren't selling. So there's definitely, you know, a a problem. And if you're in a position where you have to sell, when only 8% of the houses are selling, how how much of a price reduction do you have to do? Yeah. But the whole thing is, is, you know, who would buy that house? Is it a first-timer or a move-up buyer? It's the move-up buyer. So, you know, this is where if you put your creative hat on, you say, hey, you know what? If you buy my house, I'll buy yours. 
So would you rather have a mortgage on a $500,000 house or a $300,000 house? I mean, you buy, if you kept trading down to get that person out of their problem, you would actually hit a point where that house would then be in a, in a highly sought after market and, and be able to, to sell it. So, I mean, it's way better than sitting there at a million dollars and having 160 competitors and, and only <laughs> five selling in a month. I mean, you, you can lower your price a couple hundred thousand and still not get an offer. Right. Amazing. Um, wow. It, it seems like in Tucson, I mean, if, you, if you have a hundred, I, mean, well, I don't want to get into the investment piece of it because my audience doesn't care about it, but um, 125 <laughs> houses under a hundred grand. I mean, it seems like, you know, the, what you could, the rents, it seems like that'd be It seems like that's rich for investment opportunity. I, I don't know if I'm just right. Uh, the, the rents on a, on a three bedroom home here um, run between 900 and $1,100 a month. Got it. So now granted, a lot of those homes are, on the market for a reason. Some of them are four bedroom and one bathroom. Some of them have been added on to two or three times in the floor plan. You have to walk through two bedrooms to get to the third. Oh. You know, it's just, you know, weird stuff like that, but it's very, very picked over. I mean, the number of, uh, you know, of homes in that price point for a city of a million people, um, you know, 125 homes under a hundred thousand, our cost of living isn't anywhere close to the same as what yours is. I mean, property taxes here on a house like that are probably right around a thousand bucks a year. Wow. And, and insurance runs about 600. So, I mean, it's, it's fairly inexpensive, but the, the biggest thing is, is as long as you're playing in a price point where the rent is cheaper than the payment, you could sell them all day long on seller finance. Right. I mean, sorry, the rent is more expensive than the payment. So if you buy this home from me, you're going to save $150 in rent. Right. You're going to pay off $75 in principal. You're going to get back in taxes from from the uh, mortgage interest and the and the um, property tax, probably another $115. And then throughout all of it, for the last 31 years, our prices here have appreciated at a 3.73. That's straight to today. You know, taking away the big boom and the big bust and everything, we're still at a 3.3, 3.73 average. So when you factor that in for appreciation, you're looking at almost 400 bucks a month in appreciation. When you add all that up, it actually ends up where some of these people who we sell a home to, even though we put a premium on it, they end up getting more in benefit from the house than they're paying for it. Amazing. Well, listen, so they're actually being, being paid to live there. We have to start wrapping up here. It's been a fascinating conversation to me. Um, is there, what did I miss? What should people know that I, I, we just didn't cover? I mean, is there something that you'd go, man, this is, this is one nugget that I would love to share with, with everybody, whether they're aspiring or, you know, they're already, you know, doing 50 or hundred transactions. Sure. Well, the biggest thing is to, you know, just stay focused on the market and, and just keep your ear to the ground. What problems are people having out there? As long as you can stay in front of people to solve their problems. And, and find a way, a solution to fix what other people aren't fixing. That's the way to succeed. If you're interested in doing any of these kind of notes and things, um, I, I, one time a year I do a training, and I, it's a charity event. I do it all for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. That is coming up here in Tucson. I hope it's okay to tell sure. you. Oh, ab- yeah, absolutely. Um, October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th in Tucson at the University Marriott um, we are having a three-day event. This is where I take everything I've done for the last year, and I basically give it away to people. I got people flying in from all over the country. I had five from Montreal, Canada come in last year. But um, I, these little events, I, I put them on, and have your check, you make it directly out to Make-A-Wish Foundation. Um, if you want to see what I'm doing and, and get it for a, a cheap price, it's $299. Uh, believe it or not, Toby, in the last, I, I started doing this in uh, 2009. That little event has raised over $300,000 for Make-A-Wish here in Tucson. That, and that's such a great organization. I love it. So, so Bob. So so, that's, uh, if you want to email, you can just send an email to uh, Bob at win3realty, W-I-N, the number three, realty.com. And, uh, you know, that's probably the best thing. If it, and then I actually built a, a little software program that I just to run these notes in, in less than a minute and just be able to have a buyer sheet, a seller sheet, 
everything that I'm going to be sharing at this year's conference. Awesome. Well, hey, listen, I, I'm sure, you know, my audience is very interactive, so I'm sure that as soon as this airs, uh, you're going to get a ton of emails. Um, I wrap up always with two of the same questions. Let me pose them to you now. We have about five minutes left, and it's the first one is this. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? Um, I wouldn't. Well, I have a, a book called Sold on Change that you can buy on Amazon, Amazon for about $15, and it is a step-by-step of how we took our business from six sales a month to 60 sales a month. There's that one. Okay. Um, but I think the best investment you could do is to take your money and go to Home Depot and buy some blank uh, bandit signs and just get a big fat Sharpie and start writing seller finance, owner will carry, and uh, cheaper than rent, put them on the, you know, on listings, on places that are legal for you to put them in your, wherever you live. Those signs for me have generated 3000 calls in the last 12 months. Wow. And, and, um, and you, and so people can do this without having inventory in the backside and just, and then once you get these calls, you put these people in the database and then, uh, um, it's kind of a chicken and the egg kind yeah, of thing. Which right. one came first? And, yeah. and it really doesn't matter which one comes first. You need a buyer and a seller for every sale. The best way to find sellers is to have buyers, especially those that want to pay over market value for a home. Got it. Okay. I, mean, that's, I love this, man. Okay. Uh, and then my, here's my last question. And uh, I, don't know if it, I don't know if it'll make sense to you, but you know, do you have any personal habits that you feel have contributed to your success? Yes. I wake up every morning and I don't look at my email and I don't answer my phone for two hours. I spend two hours every single morning on my business, not in my business. Love it. Love it. Hey, Bob Zachmeyer, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a wonderful 56 minutes. Um, I'm glad that I found you. I'm glad I met you, and I'm glad you, you decided to come on. So everybody out there, you have Bob's email, Bob at Win3 Realty. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode as much as I have, you know, reach out to him. Just, you know, even if you don't want to go to the conference, you know, just reach out to him and say thank you for sharing. So, uh, Bob, I'll, I'll tell you now, thank you for sharing. Thank you for coming on. Hey, not a problem, Toby. Thank you for having me. Talk to you soon. All right, bye. Let's go. Yeah. For those of you that want to know what we're all about, it's like this, y'all. This is 10% luck, 20% skill, 15%